Welcome everyone to the Interagency Modeling and Analysis Group Working Group Webinar Series and I'm happy to introduce the co-lead of the Integrated Multiscale Biomaterials Experiment and Modeling Working Group, otherwise known as IMU-BEAM. So here is Guy Gennon and Marcus Buehler. Thanks very much, Grace, and welcome all of you to the next installment in the International uh, Colloquium Series that's uh, organized by Stavros and Ivana. We're very pleased to, to welcome today uh, an elite group, Joyce Wong, David Kaplan, and Marcus Bueller, who are going to tell us about uh, their work on predicting biomaterial structure function uh, through integrated modeling and experimental approaches. Uh, these three need no introduction, but a few quick words. Joyce is a professor at, of biomedical engineering at, at BU. She runs the uh, cellular and subcellular mechanics laboratory there, and she's well known as, as a leading expert on biomaterials, especially tailoring cell material interfaces for tissue engineering. David is the Stern uh, Family Professor of Engineering and chairs the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Tufts. And we all know him as really the expert on biopolymer engineering based upon structure function relationships and, and really uh, he's really at the forefront of self-assembly and silk-based regenerative materials. And then Marcus, of course, uh, needs no introduction. He's professor and chair of in uh, in civil and environmental engineering at MIT. He runs the Laboratory for Atomistic and Molecular Mechanics, which has a long A, and it's uh, a short A rather than a long A, it's LAM. And, uh, and he's, he's one of the, he really is the world's expert on translating a molecular understanding of, of, of protein mechanics to really useful engineering principles. Welcome all three of you. We're looking forward to your presentation. Great, so we're going to get started. Uh, thanks, first of all, to the NIH and uh, to Grace, and uh, thanks, Guy, for the uh, brief intro. So I'm going to kick it off for the team. Uh, you'll hear from all of us as part of the uh, webinar today, and we're going to walk you through the strategies we're using and uh, the integration of the approaches to uh, start to address this need of trying to develop predictive tools related to modeling of biomaterials. And as you'll see, we are focusing on protein-based biomaterials for, for reasons that will hopefully become uh, much clearer. So uh, in terms of a, oops, this is not moving. Oh, thank you. Okay, so uh, our overall goal for the program, which is now about uh, three years in, is to uh, develop predictive tools uh, to really get away from what's been a more trial and error approach to matching structure and function in the biomaterials world. So we're, we're starting with proteins because of our um, design rules and, and guides we can get control of and we'll, we'll touch on that. But we hope as we develop these tools there'll be much broader implications for the, the, the different kinds of polymers in the field. Um, and so on this slide, what you see is um, a compendium on the left of some of the key protein motifs that we uh, think about as part of the program. And one of the real advantages here from the biomaterial perspective is these are all materials, the silk elastins and collagens that are sort of well studied in the context of biomaterials. They come from nature, but we can uh, distill them down to fairly short segments or sequences, peptides, that represent uh, the, the larger scale molecules. And this gives us something very uh, tractable in terms of um, structure function that we can start to build from to understand these, the tools we're trying to develop. Uh, and as we do our job, the goal is to fabricate materials, which you see in the middle, and we'll focus more on, on fibers today as our primary goal. And as you'll see, we're mainly focusing on the functional outcome of mechanics. And then as we learn more and more, we can scale to the applications on the right. For today, we're going to focus only on the silks and the spider silks, which is the top left. Uh, but there is ongoing work in the, in the group on collagen assembly in, uh, using the same kinds of tools, as well as elastin in combination with, um, uh, with the silk. Uh, and so the other thing to think about here is if we start at the bottom left in terms of sequence and composition, and you'll see a lot of that uh, in, in our webinar today, we can start to look at scaling issues, and you'll again see that when Marcus talks about the modeling, uh, and you'll see this as well as when we process the materials, when Joyce talks about how we then go about optimizing the environment related to spinning fibers so we can assess mechanics. 
What I think is important here is right now, on the, if we look at the property window, we're really only dealing with mechanics as our primary readout to develop these tools at present. But as we get better and better at this, uh, there is no reason not to expand the toolkit to address other functional uh, readouts that we might be interested in, be it optical, electronic, uh, thermal, biological interactions, and so on. So that's the long-term vision is to expand the tools past just the proteins and expand outside of just mechanics. But that's where the current program is focused. Um, and so our model for the, the group right now is spider silks. And for, this is true for a number of reasons. One, a number of us had a lot of prior experience with these proteins. So we have a good starting point both in the cloning work, the uh, structure function work, uh, the processing work, as well as the modeling work. And you can see some of that superimposed here in terms of the scaling factors in terms of structure from the angstrom up to the uh, nanometer, uh, millimeter scale, as well as in terms of some of the modeling tools that we'll come back to later. So this is sort of our model system to work from, to understand, and to build our uh, predictive assessments. And this is what you're going to hear about now for the next half hour or so. Um, I'll start off with the middle portion, and I'll be fairly brief just to make sure we keep time for questions, which is how do we design, clone, and express the various proteins we use, and what's our inspiration for this? Uh, then I'll hand it over to Joyce, who will talk about how she takes those proteins in her group and transforms them into functional materials from which she does mechanical assessments. And then Marcus will fill up the triad with how we sort of iterate in terms of the sequences we make, the processing results we get, and how that informs the next set of uh, sequence designs. So that's sort of the outline of what you'll hear in, again, the next half hour or so. So briefly, let me start off at the bottom left with the design, so where we get our sequences from and uh, how we approach the process of generating the proteins that we study in the program. Uh, briefly, I think it should be obvious to most of you, so I'll, I'll just summarize this. The, the idea is, is, is at the front, right? Control, control, control. Just like if you're buying property, it's all about uh, location, location, location. So proteins are fantastic, as most of you know, because we can get uh, genetic blueprints, which give us very precise control of sequence chemistry. <laughs> Okay, somebody just muted, thank you. Uh, so we have uh, detailed control of sequence chemistry, of size, of chirality, all the things you really want to regulate so we can then uh, better understand relationships to function and in embed that in the modeling tools. Obviously for the proteins we use, the, they're all fibrous proteins, the elastins, silks, collagens. So these are all amenable to fairly robust materials when we're done. Uh, they can all be processed in a green aqueous environments and have lots of other implications that we won't cover today. So our inspiration comes from spider silks. You can see a, just an example here of an orb web. And the, uh, the primary sort of source here are the uh, major ampullate gland silks, which are really the key structural elements in a spun orb web from many spider species. These have been looked at and studied for uh, now decades, uh, and so we have a very good handle on sequence repeats and how these relate to the features of these silks. So out of that, we distill what you see on this next slide, which is essentially from a hierarchical perspective, looking at the orb web, we take a single fiber, we look at the sequence data that's out there, and we build then consensus domains or blocks for the studies we're doing. And you can see on the bottom left, we have consensus, two consensus domains that we use. The A block is in red, that's our hydrophobic domain. So think of that as the hard block, the cross-linking block, in terms of physical beta sheet cross-links. You see the polyalanine domain in there, that really drives the hydrophobicity with the methyl side chains. And then the second block is a consensus from the other domains in the silk, in the major ampullic gland silk, and here, this is our softer block uh, that's not going to form beta sheets, and so it gives us more uh, flexibility with the outcomes in terms of mechanics and so on. So from a um, genetic perspective, we design two consensus domains. You see, uh, see that on the bottom right. 
the hydrophobic polyalanine repetitive A block and then the hydrophilic B block. And then we simply mix and match these with uh, tight control in the cloning process to generate a family of block copolymers where we can systematically study either size, um, sequence arrangements of domains, uh, and things we'll talk about uh, another time, the, the role of different domains on the ends of these as well that can all affect the assembly and the mechanics and that we can bring in from the modeling perspective as well. So very briefly, uh, you can see some examples of the sequences we generate. This is a short list of a much longer set of uh, spider silk variants we generate. And all these derive from that same approach. We take the A and B blocks and we mix and match in terms of repeats, sizes, and so on. And you can see you know, the sizes of the proteins we generally work with run anywhere from 10 to 50 kilodaltons in general, although part of the program we won't have time to talk about is uh, a set of much larger sequences that we're trying to understand in the same tools uh, at present. So these are all cloned, expressed, and characterized. So I just want to walk you through a very briefly uh, summarized set of slides on how we do this and happy to fill in details and we'll post some of the papers that cover the, the details of the, of the cloning uh, on the website as well. So you have these. So we start with a suitable cloning vector. Uh, we build the two uh, domains, the A and the B, B block, you see that in red and green. These are done with synthetic oligonucleotides to encode those repeats. Those are then cloned in with uh, ligation experiments where with successful orientation, we destroy the restriction enzyme site between the two, which means we can uh, validate proper orientation based on uh, susceptibility or not to restriction digestion when we're done. So this gives us a great set of tools and we can here mix the number of A blocks, the number of B blocks, the sequences, the sizes, all by recursive ligation using this basic strategy that you see on the slide. Second step, once we've done that, is to express these from a expression vector and we then run standard agarose gels of different kinds to validate sequence size. And then we actually take these sequences and go through uh, traditional sequencing to validate that we haven't lost or had any mutations uh, in the original designs. And then these are taken on into cloning experiments in terms of expression. And that's what you see on this slide. These are transformed into E. coli uh, with the appropriate scaling. We either use small shake flasks or we go to larger fermentation depending on the yields that we need. And out of this comes the uh, expressed recombinant spider silk block copolymers of various iterations based on what I showed you before. At this stage, we go through purification. That's why we have a histidine tag on the ends of these, although we have looked at some without the tag to make sure we understand the role of these in the assembly and properties. And uh, as you see on this slide, we basically use a, a nickel affinity column, which is pretty standard to get very good purity of these proteins. This is good for reasonably small scale purification. For larger scale, we have to use other methods, mainly because of a just scaling issue and costs. But when we're done with this process, we then have a very pure set of proteins we can use in the processing work in Joyce's lab. And obviously, this is all embedded with the modeling guidance work uh, with uh, Marcus's lab. And just quickly, you can see examples of purified proteins. We get very nice clean bands. You see six examples of these block copolymers here. So the process works very, work, very well. Uh, and we go through normal biophysical characterization, which I'm just going to skip because you'll have the slides. This is all published to show we go through standard FTIR with uh, deconvolution to calculate uh, essentially beta sheet content. You can see at the bottom the BA3 is the enriched hydrophobic domain that has the much higher uh, crystalline content than the AB3 which is basically dominated by the non-hydrophobic domain where there's very low beta sheet content. And this is further validated with uh, diffraction analysis to make sure we have the materials we expected. Uh, we look at morphology, but I'll let Joyce focus on that in her work. So let me turn it over to Joyce to talk about the processing next. Okay, thank you, David. So uh, I'm going to talk about the, the processing aspects now. 
So just to give you a brief outline, um, I'm going to mainly focus on the different kinds of processing techniques we've, we've done and also the characterization, which is really critical as an input for the, the modeling and also in terms of the feedback, in terms of the, the genetic engineering, in terms of designing the materials. So I'll skip this because David already gave a, a very nice introduction about silk um, and all the different kinds of ways you can process it. So I'll just go very quickly through this and also just to keep an eye on the, the end game, right, is where we're very interested ultimately in how these materials interface with cells. And so this is one of our long-term goals. And so um, although today we are not talking about um, the interactions with cells, this is something we are do have expertise and, and are, are doing in, in separate studies. So just to tell you, um, these are some kind of limitations of um, the processing right now. Um, you can do electrospinning, wet spinning, um, and microfluidics. And what we had to reframe this in terms of this new this collaboration between um, the, you know, uh, the BU, um, Tufts, and, and MIT was really to say, how can we think about this integratively? And so what we um, used as a model is to, to look at um, the silk fibroid to, to first kind of nail down the kinds of processing we can do. And to do this, we want to optimize fibers for desired cell response. So again, this just um, emphasizing again what, what um, David has told you about the relationships between structure, properties, and processing. And so here's a very um, typical example. So, so from, from David's lab, we'll be basically get lyophilized material. And we like to do this in green um, processing. But we, from the, the early studies, we found that some of these materials were not soluble. So we had to use um, HFIP um, and, and some more um, stringent materials. But basically, we've, we've evolved so we can do a lot of our studies in water. So then these are just kind of specific details on how we actually process the material. Um, oops, sorry, oops. And so here, this is um, something I, I had shown in an earlier slide was the microfluidics, but, but this is actually something that came out of um, the iteration between the three groups. And I just want to take um, a couple seconds here to really emphasize kind of the, the impact this has had on all of our groups, I think, because of the postdocs and graduate students who we meet you know, monthly, it's really very exciting to see them interact with each other. And so they recognize how they, they're adapting the processing techniques right, in relationship to the modeling, for example. This is one example where we ended up evolving our um, processing method because we realized that our shear rates were much too low in the microfluidic um, example. So then we switched to something um, to doing the, the high shear wet spinning, which then gave us quite different um, results. And this was really through um, a, a, a true collaboration between the three groups in, at Tufts, BU, and MIT. And so here's just a, um, I don't know if this video will work. Let me show you. OK, there you go. So you can just see coming out of the needle here, material is collecting. OK. And so this is one of our um, initial um, designs of the microfluidic spinning, where you can actually um, concentrate using polyethylene oxide. And um, you can then have elongational flow. Um, but what I, what I should mention is that we, we have um, added the shear flow with the, um, you know, with a very simple needle. And that ended up being very, working very well in terms of, um, again, that was was through um, extensive interactions between all of the groups. So now moving on to the characterization, something that's really critical is, is determining the diameter, because you can imagine um, we have to normalize for the properties. Also, depending on how these um, materials are treated at the end, if, in case if they're um, drawn, you can actually uh, alter their structural alignment, and that's going to also impact their properties. So what we do is we load them onto a frame and then basically use an instron um, to measure their mechanical properties. And here's just an example showing you the different kinds of um, average diameters we can get. Um, and then something that, that David had touched upon is the FTIR, which is one really nice method of, of characterizing the structural properties of these materials. But as you'll hear from Marcus, this is really critical in terms of the, the predictions that they can make in terms of the beta sheets and the alpha helices. And so this is something where, again, it's validation that we can determine experimentally um, of the FTIR of the samples that we're actually processing and then compare that to what the, um, the computational modeling predicts. 
Um, and so these are just examples of some of the materials we've had and, and the relative levels of, of beta sheet content and comparing microfluidic fibers with native fibers. And just to show you that it's a very close um, biomimetic system that we've been able to do. And um, those are just some details on the, the, the nice thing about silk is there's really defined um, uh, peaks that you can associate with silk one and silk two. Okay, so then moving on to the uh, mechanical testing again. So this is just describing how we can actually load these these materials and start stretching. And then basically, this is a custom built um, apparatus made in, in in my laboratory, where we can actually uh, measure fibers and also very weak films. But the 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 point is is that you can track um, this and that also do it on under different conditions if you wanted to change pH and temperature and things. Um, and so this is an example of a typical result that you would get. And again, this is the kind of thing um, that we would hope to, again, um, compare to with the, with the modeling. Um, and then here's just some examples of results that we've been able to do from group A, group B. And as, as David showed you, there were some different sequences that we were able to do. And the, the big um, kind of overall picture, right, is that you can dial in and you can um, design, if you will, um, using the genetic sequence, we would like to then predict the patient modeling and then actually do the processing and then validate. Okay, and so now I'll pass it on to Marcus. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce and David. Um, <clears throat> so I'll continue really talking about the um, simulation pieces of this whole um, work. Um, and um, the the way we look at this problem is some microphone. Uh, can you please all in which meet microphones? Sure. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so the way we look at this problem, really, um, in the modeling from a modeling perspective, it's a really complicated multi-scale problem. So you can see on the left, we start from the, the chemical scales of true multi-scale models that really take the information from the molecular scale, have to incorporate really details of hydrogen bonding, secondary structures, and others. But we're also interested really in, in the scales of micrometers and beyond in ultimately predicting the behavior or functional behavior at the scale of biological tissues and cell interactions. And so the problem within um, exploring and, and designing here really spans multiple orders of magnitudes and scales. And uh, what I'll do today, I'll actually walk you through some of the details in the codes and scripts and, um, and how we actually run these simulations and, and share with you um, the kind of predictions we can make and how these predictions compare with the experimental results you've heard about before. So this is um, going to include a couple of references to files and scripts that I've posted in a link on the, on the iMovie um, iMac wiki site. Um, which um, we'll be sending it around, I think, in a follow-up email as well. So if you look at the bottom part of this um, slide, you can see a couple of the things we're after. Um, as Joyce mentioned, we're really interested in being able to dial in certain properties, um, so controlling the stiffness, um, the toughness, and the strength. And um, this, uh, these measurements typically are taken at the scale of a fiber, of a micrometer fiber that uh, Joyce can produce. Um, but the elements that go into this are the kind of biologically engineered constructs of peptides and proteins that uh, David can make. And um, so the, the modeling feels really an important niche uh, um, in connecting the chemical scale, the design space, with the processing, um, with the functional properties of the mechanics of these micrometer scales. And, and I'll get back to a bunch of these different things later, especially the processing. So one of the really important things, of course, in silk um, manufacturing is that we need to consider how these proteins are actually assembled and what the processing conditions are. So the modeling tools we've developed are very suitable for this as well. Um, okay, so we um, um, look at silk, um, again, from really a perspective of, of a nanocomposite that is made from different uh, molecular constructs that are can be grouped into hydrophobic and hydrophilic and certain secondary structures like nanocrystalline beta sheets that form the cross-links and more amorphous pieces that form a polymer matrix. Um, and these really um, um, can be resolved um, all the way down to the molecular scale, the domestic scale, which you can see here. Uh, this is work. 
that really is the foundation for the modeling is understanding how these different sequence patterns actually create secondary structures which form the larger mesoscale structures. So these are the mesoscale structures we are really uh, interested in uh, in this uh, in this work because they control many of the properties, but they are ultimately defined by these sequence patterns which you see down here and. Uh, here we've been able to develop this multi-scale modeling scheme in such a way that we can recover these different scales. So we can resolve information from the sequence scale, uh, we can predict the secondary structure composition, as well as the mesoscale and how they behave as a fiber. Um, so, and again, this really um, connects a couple of different pieces in the project. So we connect, of course, the synthesis because we can identify, engineer, predict which sequence patterns, which sequences. Um, work best. We also have an ability in the model to um, simulate explicitly the shear flow processing that Joyce has uh, evolved in her lab. Um, and um, the multi scale scheme thereby allows us to connect the different pieces in this entire um, um, project, really. Um, in closing the loop and predicting and, and testing, and again, con looping back to the modeling, really, and, and trying to advance the modeling itself as well. Um, so the way the modeling works, and this is for those of you who are um, really experienced modelers, um, this might you know, might be familiar. For those of you who are um, in the experimental world, I mean, this is uh, really a detailed snapshot. We hope in giving you an idea of how this actually is done, and uh, we have scripts and codes on the website that allow you to play with this if you like. And our students and postdocs are available to, of course, answer any questions you might have. Um, so the way this modeling is resolved as we um, use um, different levels of modeling. The main tool we're going to talk about today is the mesoscale of coarse grain modeling. Um, and really what it does is resolves about three amino acids for each bead or particle. And um, we then have um, the, the capital B, which uh, David talked about, which um, is the building block uh, in, these, in these sequences, A and B, and the terminal uh, pieces as well in the future. Um, uh, it really is resolved by several of these smaller B, small b um, um, particle letters. Um, and uh, you can see that we can thereby control the sequence length as well. So we have really a one-dimensional description. It's a one-dimensional sequence, which can actually fold, of course, into three-dimensional shapes. Um, and by changing the number of B beads here, um, each of which really represents a collection of amino acids, we can thereby describe different lengths of B patterns. Okay. We can also change the interactions uh, between the A and B beads, which reflects different hydrophobicities, hydrophilicities, different sequences at the amino acid scale, different pH values, different uh, spinning conditions, and so on. So there's a lot of design space in there uh, that we're exploring, and that can be used for designing better sequences. Um, so um, the other big ingredient, of course, in the model is not the protein only, but it's the, the water, the solvent. And so here we describe about 10 water molecules as one particle. Um, and it's an explicit description of water thereby. Um, and um, the, um, the principle really applied here is that we have a shape-based and weight-based coarse graining. We have an actual explicit description of the geometry of these, of these structures. Um, and the way we... Um, and what we'd like to do here today is to share with all of you um, these codes. Um, these are a combination of MATLAB and C++ codes that you can download, again, from the wiki site. Um, we have a Dropbox folder, and there are a whole bunch of files in there. We'll be, we'll be adding a manual that would basically reflect what's in these slides today with a little more detail. Um, and we, as David was saying, uh, we'll be adding a bunch of papers as well, so you can see the results and the methods and how we connected the the experiment simulation and design in this in this process, so you can really uh, dig into this quite quite deeply. Um, and so the way the step one typically starts by um, developing configurations as a code, a MATLAB code um, that is uh, this file here. So you basically go to the, um, the Dropbox file and you can you can run it. And uh, there, um, to give you a flavor for this design process, you can re you can really become a protein designer here because you can now control um, how many repeating units are the motifs. So you can specify it's an H an A1 B2 or an A3 B or a A B3 or whatever sequence pattern you like to try. Um, <clears throat> you can define how many A small A's there are in an A block, how many B's there are in a B block. And the H block is the is, uh, sort of the first two additional terminal domains or um, auxiliary domains that have attached the the histidine tag um, that David mentioned earlier. 
Uh, but we can add other ones too. So this code could be expanded very easily to add C block and D blocks and others. Uh, and then the, uh, the final one is sort of how many repeats there are in this motif. So it's quite convenient, and you can see um, we can play with this. So if you like to try a new sequence with um, 20 A's and 1 B or uh, any kind of thing, you can easily create that. Um, and then the rest is automatically filled in this box of simulation universe that's created is filled with water beads. Okay. Um, and um, this will also generate a LAMPS data file. So once you um, run this code, um, you actually will be given a, a LAMPS input file. Uh, LAMPS is the code we're running these simulations with. And you, you can download, you can see if you click on this link here, um, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, it's really small, but um, there's a hyperlink to a website. Um, it's a Sandia uh, National Lab code that is free to download for anyone. And there's a VMD analysis code as well, which is visualization that we use. And again, these um, the code actually generates both LAMPS files and VMD files. So you can run the code, and you can also analyze the results quite very conveniently, both of these. So you can click on these links uh, when you download the, the, these files. We'll put these files, these slides in there as well. You can click on this, and you can, you can download the codes if you wish. They're both free. Um, so the way this um, model is formulated, we have a dissipative particle dynamics simulation. Um, formulism, and basically this is something that's been around for a long time. Um, we've adapted this formulation here for this protein, this particular protein system, um, and it has um, sort of terms that describe um, forces, interaction forces. Um, these are the interactions between particles. It's a soft conservative force, and it also adds um, pairwise stochastic thermostat. So this describes the hydrodynamics and um, of the interactions. And um, at the same time, by controlling these, uh, this A parameter, AIJ parameter of the interactions, we can control how different particles or beads actually interact. And um, that uh, is a reflection of the hydrophobicity um, of, these, of these particles. That's really what first down to the level of the amino acids that are in the sequence patterns of the small A's and the small B's. Um, and in, the, in some of the papers we'll be posting, we'll actually tell you how we de derive these parameters, AIJ and BIJ and others that we've used here. Um, and you could, if you wanted to adapt the codes and the model for different sequences, you can follow the same paradigm we've used here, um, or you can develop your own pattern. Um, but we'll tell you how we did it in, in, this, in this particular setup here. Um, and you can see here on the right-hand side sort of how this uh, works. So you have interactions between A and B, B and B, A and A, and also between the water and the A's and the B's. Uh, and those are all the uh, these little parameters that go into this, into this equation here. There's also a description for hydrogen bonds and the connection within the um, polymer chain um, to describe the one-dimensional structure. Um, and this is, again, how the forces break down. So this is really the, the workhorse of the simulation um, setup, and, um, and um, we, can, we can run the simulations. Now, um, because we've coarse-grained um, the system, we, um, we don't have the typical um, um, very strong um, repulsive potential that we have in the MD formulation. We're dealing with atoms. Here we have a smooth dissipative particle dynamic simulation, so we actually have a soft potential. Right. And so um, at the coarse graining, once we coarse grain atoms into structures and the polymer sequences and patterns and um, higher hierarchies, um, we, we use this description here um, that uh, describes the attraction interaction between these particles. Um, so this formulism actually is, I think, quite visually apparent when you look on the right-hand side here. Um, you can see the scale we'll be able to tackle here. It's quite exciting. So we have, um, I think you can see if you look closely on the screen, you can see the individual particles. So these are the small A's and B and, and, and particles. Um, you can see here, I know that the water beads are removed because, of course, um, water is everywhere and you wouldn't be able to see anything. So we'll remove the water beads here. But you, they're always there. Um, and um, the colors reflect um, the H, um, um, the histidine tag, the A and the B. And, uh, you can see the resolution is quite fine, so we're actually able to describe um, essentially secondary structure clusters of, of uh, structures that are rich in beta sheets, or those that are um, more um, less organized, or um, which are these um, these, uh, these B particles. Um, we also have um, a scale here of 10 nanometers in spectral simulations. So you can see the whole box might be 100 nanometers, um, and we can go much larger with this as well. So. It's a scale that definitely is on the level of a fiber, uh, of a small fiber experiment, but we're approaching a scale sort of matched to the experimental fibers. And uh, we can describe heterogeneities across the cross section. Right? So you can see this is the fiber direction, but um, you can see all sorts of patterns and other structures forming here. So when we actually load mechanically, 
um, it, is, um, it is large enough so that these defects and shapes of these better sheet clusters, which are these um, reddish regions here, can be seen to interact in, in very complex ways. And, and this is ultimately what defines the mechanical properties. Right? Um, also, um, the processing is very important. So we learned early on that um, the, um, the shearing in the microfluidic channel, as we're doing in the experiment, is really an important ingredient in forming the microstructure or nanostructure that defines silk fibers. So without shearing, we really don't get the connectivities. Now, I'll show some data later, but the simulation is confirmed. Um, and uh, we've been able to, uh, to essentially simulate the shearing uh, using these uh, Lee Edwards boundary conditions. An early paper where this has been used for molecular simulations. We've adapted this now to in this in this DPD framework, the dissipative particle dynamics framework, um, and uh, we can control basically the shear rate doing the simulation and simulate this um, the shearing process. So what you do. Um, um, so this, this is a background of the model, but if you, when you now actually want to run the simulations, you've done step one, you've run the, the MATLAB code, you've now downloaded LAMPS, you've compiled it, hopefully worked out fine. Um, we need to um, um, use a modified, uh, we need to edit the code essentially, we've done this already, and so we have a uh, file that's the Pearsoft CPP, which is uh, a, a modified version that you can download from the Dropbox file folder and you place it in the source directory of LAMPS and you recompile LAMPS uh, again. So I think it's a good idea to try to compile it before the download and then after the replacement so you know that um, the code actually compiles fine without the edits. Um, and then you run the code and essentially you get these input files that the code will generate for you. Um, this is the input file here. Um, and uh, make sure you have, of course, um, be able to run LAMPS in a cluster, ideally, because this will run for about 400 CPU hours. So you might wait for quite a long time if you're, this is a small problem, but you, you, you can easily scale it up to very, very long demands. Um, and the code will run and will ultimately will give you a bunch of uh, files. So these DCD are trajectory files. We have uh, stress information and a couple of restart files so in case you wanted to um, uh, restart the code or if you wanted to, um, uh, do different boundary conditions and so on, you can do all this. And the nice thing is in LAMPS, uh, you can essentially run and manipulate the data in uh, the coordinates with any way you like. Um, in other words, if you like to apply um, different kind of straining conditions, if you have to apply forces or any kind of different, um, different boundary conditions, you can easily do this. You can use the whole machinery of LAMPS that you've already used for other systems um, and you can apply this to, to do a whole bunch of different things and testing properties here. Um, also, potentially, um, if you want to calculate other properties like thermal optical properties, you can do this potentially as well. And this is something we're planning to work on the next um, iteration of this project in, um, in, in expanding beyond mechanical properties, of course, here. So this is how it looks like. So this is a couple of snapshots here for um, the simulation you'll get from the HAB3 sequence, the HAB2 uh, sequence, and the HA3B. Um, again, simulation snapshots, you can see the coloring. So it's something you can visualize using VND, Visual Molecular Dynamics. Again, I, um, the code will automatically generate files. It's very easy to, to, um, to, to do this and, and display. Um, and these are comparisons here with SEM pictures. So this is something you'll find um, much more about in the, in the actual long articles um, that we, were, we have published and are publishing um, at this moment um, where we can compare them. But you can see how the um, some of the patterns and features reach scales in the simulation. If we scale up to the limits and if in the experiment we go down the limit, we can actually begin to see similar morphological features. Um, now the step four is a whole bunch of um, analyses files that we provide. And again, in the, in the Dropbox folder, um, there's a link here, it's a tar file, um, and that has a whole bunch of different um, tools for you that you can use. Uh, again, these are things we've applied, and uh, of course there's no limit to what you can do with the data. You can uh, run uh, other ways of, of connecting the, the dots. Um, what we have done here, we're focused on the, um, on, on the analysis of the network because that's something we, the geometry from the network, the connectivity is something we used in our work as a way of um, analyzing, interpreting the stress strain behavior and uh, understanding the mechanism of how the mechanics actually comes about. Um, but you can do other things. You can uh, develop your own tools with this and you can even, of course, you can modify the connectivity analysis and the stress strain curve and all these things <coughs> in a way that you like. And so we hope really that these tools will be useful for, for many other research groups um, that are interested in these, in these systems. Um, so a couple of examples of what the code does. So again, I said we use geometric features in, in understanding the data. So we have um, 
a, a, a tool that provides a quantitative network analysis of how connected is the network. Um, so this is the HAB3, uh, HAB2, and this is the HAB3. Uh, and you can see how um, this is not connected. These are highly connected. Uh, and these uh, sort of re represent these molecular structures. You see at the bottom of the molecular structure is really um, uh, com quite complicated. And you can't really see how connected they are. In fact, the connectivity is existing on the left. It doesn't exist here on the right. And so this is something you wouldn't be able to see if you look at the full molecular picture. So the analysis tools are quite useful in deriving sort of key insight into, uh, into the structure. We can also see um, how a shearing system is important. So again, this provided really important insights for the experimental design um, in that um, shearing increases the connectivity very significantly. So the way we plot the data here is the thicker the lines, the more connections there are. So um, the shearing not only increases connectivity um, both before and after, but also um, increases connectivity in one direction, so it creates an anisotropic structure. So the fiber becomes very strong in the fiber direction, very connected, and there's some connectivity out of plane in the orthogonal direction, but of course um, it doesn't increase significantly under shearing. So the shearing creates, um, we think, <coughs> some very important mechanical traits. And now we talk a little bit about the, um, the design aspect. So what the model, of course, now allows you to do, this set of tools, is you can run as I told you, I showed you in the beginning, how do you actually do it? I mean, you, you just plug in different numbers and you can say, <coughs> I'm going to study an HAB2 sequence, HAB4, 8, and 12, and we can run this and we can test the mechanics um, that come out of these different sequences. And this is what's shown here. So you can see how properties change. And as Joyce mentioned earlier, the idea is, of course, you want to dial in certain properties. And so you can see how this works, right? So you can run the simulation. You can see this is the number of beads per node. Um, and as we increase the length, this is the design parameter we look at here, um, we get better connectivity and higher number of, of, of connections, also higher number of bridges between the nodes, um, and the um, network conductance, which is really the measure for how connected the system is. And that's <coughs> really a key property in understanding the strength and elasticity of these fibers. You can see how the HAB2 sequence has a zero conductance, that is, there's no connection. This is one of the examples I've showed earlier. Um, <coughs> up to very, very connected systems here where uh, the HAB12 is the best performer. And these are the kinds of things that we explored in experiment as well. So we've actually created these sequences in experiment, in experiment and made them and tested them. And this is something in a, that will come out in a paper in a few days. I think we have a paper coming out in Nature Communications that talks about these different designs and performances. Um, and we'll post the paper as soon as it's out there. <coughs> we'll post it in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the in the wiki, so you can you can read that, and that gives a lot of background information into what I've mentioned here today. Um, and you can see uh, this actually is sort of uh, the, the processing is really prevalent here. So we start from the calibration, um, in which during which the network conductance doesn't really change much. Um, to the shear flow, where there's a significant increase, and in the calibration, really during the shearing, at a certain a certain level. And then this is the mechanical testing. So this is the last stage of the simulation where we actually pull the system. So when you run these LAMS codes, you'll actually get these results. It does all the three stages in one in one file. Um, and you can read out the data. Uh, and you can read out properties as, as, as you wish along the way. Um, and, um, and these are some of the mechanical testings. Again, you can see this is the stress versus strain. We can produce that um, before shear, after shear. And you can see how. Um, very nicely, the longer sequences allow you to create a much stronger structure, a much more extensible structure, um, and, and uh, sort of mimicking closely what the natural silk behavior is, and so approaching that, that kind of behavior. Uh, and you can also, as I've shown a couple of snapshots already, you can nicely, you can very beautifully plot the nanostructure and mesoscale structure during deformation. And that's the the kind of information that is really hard to read from an experiment um, because the scale, the resolution here is um, sub-nanometer. Um, the overall scale could be 100 nanometers. So you're really in a scale here where ASM could be applied, but you wouldn't be able to get exact information. Simulation also gives you these connectivity maps. And so we can really understand how these fibers perform, behave differently. Um, that's the experimental equivalent. And Joyce talked about these before, um, how they look like. Um, and so the, 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 uh, the challenge, of course, is now, um, and what we've done in the paper that you'll, you'll see coming out soon, is to connecting these um, experimental snapshots 
um, enriching that information with the simulation data, which gives you sort of very, very fine detailed information, um, and using this in, uh, in advancing the, uh, the different conditions. And so here we have um, a sort of snapshot of what we're doing right now. We're exploring um, different solvents, and that's a um, very important processing parameter, not only shearing, but also the uh, geometric confinement during shearing, but also um, the different solvent conditions. And the way they enter the model is by changing these interactions between the A and the B and the water molecules. Okay, and so um, these interaction parameters can be derived from a atomistic perspective by running conventional molecular dynamics simulations, which I did not talk about today. But this is how we can actually get these parameters of interaction for different solvents. And, um, and that's sort of how the simulation has driven the experiment. Now the experiment is driving the simulation and, and asking us to advance the model and enriching the model. Uh, and this is how we've been working quite effectively in the group. So again, as I've heard earlier from David, we, the students meet, um, the students running the experiments meet, the students running the simulation, um, the students who are doing the cloning uh, actually see the other ones. And um, there's also a sense that of understanding why these simulations are really important because the cloning might take a couple of months. Um, and the simulation might take a couple of days. And so we can really um, speed up the process by which we design these, these, these sequences. Um, and uh, David alluded to one thing that I want to also show here. And this is, again, an example of how the model that you, you now all have can be easily expanded. So one thing we're exploring at this point is the effect of the, AP, um, the CNN terminal domains that are um, present in natural silk. Um, we have the histidine tag on one side in these in these models. We have the N-terminal uh, domain that we're playing with on the other end. And in between, we have these patterns of A's and B's. And so um, by adding another particle, um, which reflects these additional domains, we can enrich the model and advance the model quite easily um, and describe other sequence patterns. And this is not limited to silk. Um, some of the work we've been playing with is also adding elastin sequences. And again, this could be done in the same way. So we can we can easily add new particles and describe the interactions and repeat the same process. And so basically, the design space becomes larger. And um, what you'll see coming out of the group here now are uh, really the first studies coming out of the AB sequences which, with, with, with the histidine tag. Um, in the near future, you'll be seeing um, some of the, um, the terminal domains being added, um, as well as additional processing conditions, different solvents. Um, and you also see um, um, sort of beyond the, the initial designs, you see design of some very new properties we hope that you see are coming out and really dialing in properties um, in a computer simulation and making those structures. And so I'm very excited about the, the whole integration and I, um, I can say that these are the students. You can see the names of the students and postdocs involved here. Um, we actually we had a meeting today where we met the whole group meets uh, once a month and and percents, the students present, postdocs present, they meet outside of these meetings as well, and they visit each other's labs. Uh, we have a couple of shared appointments between postdocs and um, different groups. So what we found is that being physically close here in the Boston area was really important as an enabling uh, tool, really, for um, the, uh, the, the, the mutual interactions in the labs of the, between those and students. So I think I'm going to hand it back to David. Um, I'll close it up here, yeah. So I think we're, we're done here. This is our last slide. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Marcus. I'm the only person unmuted, which is why I'm the only person you can hear clapping. So I, I'd now like to turn this over to Ivana Yashuk and Stavros Tomopoulos, who are the uh, leads of the Ami Beam uh, International Colloquium Series. Uh, and they, they will uh, field questions. So if you, if you have a question, as I, uh, of course, do, uh, please unmute your microphone. Leave yourself muted uh, unless you, until uh, Stavros and uh, Ivana address you. Stavros. Yeah, thank you. So uh, it's op open to uh, questions. I don't know if anyone has one, one to start. I'll, I'll uh, Victor Berman, that is your, uh, is your computer. Could you mute up? Thanks. So, Oh, sorry. So, please hit the mute button. Uh, Grace, can you mute Victor? Thanks. Right. So, so I, I would, I'd like to start off with a question, unless you have one, Starburst. I do, but I'll let you start. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, so one of one of the uh, really overarching themes of materials in general is the role of uniformity. Now, you you have some really fascinating metrics 
that go that, that start off in the uh, in, in, in simulations and can really work their way all the way up through through processing and then and then uh, production. And uh, uh, so you're looking at conductivity. Do you guys have a sense of what kind of variance in conductivity is acceptable? What kinds would lead to to uh, uh, degraded material performance, and, and, and what what kinds of thresholds are needed for, for for really enhancing material performance? And just more generally, a question for the three of you: How much of a concern is uniformity in this processing? I, I, this is Roy Stewart. So I think uniformity clearly is important, but I think it depends on the application you're going after, right? Like if you wanted ultimately to do, like some of the applications that David showed early on, um, you know, on the right-hand side, um, side of the slide, those you would clearly have to have a lot of reproducibility. But I also think that, um, so some of our ongoing studies, we are seeing, uh, depending on the sequence, we see really tight, um, properties that they're very actually um, you know have very uniform properties but then we actually have other sequences that give us a little bit more of a range and I think that's actually interesting because we can then look to see what is it that is giving rise to these you know the differences in properties and actually one could also argue that for um, uh, I guess in terms of mechanics I know right you don't necessarily want everything to be the same property because you could potentially have catastrophic failure right so you so as, as you know, right, in modeling, sometimes you want a kind of a distribution of, of properties. So I think the real key is can we explain, right, can we set kind of ranges and see, you know, does, does Marcus's modeling, can that explain, the, you know, the tensile testing that, that my students do? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to add something to this. Um, so in the, um, <coughs> the guy, um, I would say from the theory that we have done on this, we actually do much of the uh, by very negative outcomes on fibers. In other words, we have fiber that is made from um, at a micrometer scale, but it's very homogeneous and structured. Um, we live from the simulation. Marcus, we can't really hear you very well. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, is it better now? Yes. Thank you. So, yeah. So I say, as a, too much homogeneity actually would be a, a potentially lead to catastrophic failure of the system, um, is what the theory tells us. So we actually know that by by adding deliberate defects or bundling little microscopic fibrils or fibers, actually is a key element in uh, we think how um, the, the exceptional performance of natural silk, which has tells us from Peter Pascal. Uh, can be reached, um, which is something we haven't been able to actually manufacture. Right? So our fibers are not made from bundles of fibrils, as far as we know, um, or at least we don't know how to control these bundles. Um, and um, again, in theory, the sort of the addition of, of heterogeneous structures at different length scales is actually really key in achieving some of the properties. Uh, does this answer a uh, question, Guy? So the two elements, I think Joyce was talking about the really that we find some sequences really create more randomization of properties in the experiment. And the theory tells us that uh, we want randomization of structure in some cases to create better performance. Um, and it provides an interesting intellectual debate now in whether some are desired or are adverse effects on properties. Um, and that's exactly what we're trying to understand here. Uh, thank you. And add one more comment that um, the other approach we can take, which we started experimentally first, is to uh, start to generate uh, gradient structures and understand the mechanics of the gradients, and then that, that can inform the modeling and vice versa. Again, we're just at the beginning of that, so I think there's a, a lot that can be done there to, in a different way to answer your question, guys. As well. mm -hmm. Thank you. So let, let, let me maybe ask a related question from the synthesis perspective. So, so you spoke really nicely about the, the lowest uh, length scale at the atomistic through creating very, very particular protein uh, sequences and synthesizing those. And then at the larger length scale, creating structures like tubes or sheets or you know, various, uh, uh, various forms. 
But what about the intermediate level? So you can, for example, create a tube that has radially aligned fibers or longitudinally aligned fibers. Obviously, the mechanics are going to be very different between those two. Can you talk a little bit about control of the synthesis of that, uh, that level of the structure? I think um, at least for the, the approaches Joyce covered, which is more of the microfluidic strategies, um, that's going to be sort of monolithic still, right, Steve? So that's that's not not going to really answer your question. To get at what you're talking about, we have started to look at, I'd call it more composite materials where we have fiber embedded matrices as one example, and that's where I would get the kinds of domains and controls, the regions you're talking about a little better. I, I'd say, again, that's early days of that. Um, but I, I think there's some other kinds of processing approaches that allow us to get more control of those regions that, that you're moving to, which I think is a, is a great time. So, yeah. So just to add to that, I think, for example, we didn't talk about it today, but something we've been looking at, too, is just like changing even ion flow, like the, the composition of the ion actually makes a very big difference. Um, just, I mean, there's a lot of different parameters, and it's something we also didn't talk about today was pH. You know, that clearly um, can change a lot of the things. I think there, it's important to, to make a distinction, though. The microfluidics is really attractive and very nice, right, because you can add in a lot of elements, too. But one, one of the disadvantages that we discovered, actually, as a result of this kind of um, iteration between the three groups, the collaboration between the three groups, and really the postdocs and students, I should say, is they discovered very quickly that the shear rate was way too low for the uh, microfluidics. And so we had to really quickly kind of pivot and, and um, move into, you know, different different methods. So I think there's going to be, I mean, there, there's the whole multi-scale aspect of this. I think, Mark, we have the, that's fitting. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, because no. there are going to be different at, at the multi-scale, right, different challenges. Yeah, so I, I put the slide up here that I, that I think we, we saw a couple of times during the presentation today, and this is how natural silk looks like, or at least we think it looks like, you know, some unknowns in that, in the, in the actual structure, but, um, but but it's clear there are multiple levels in the hierarchy, and scaling really goes through the small scale to large scale, and I think what we are today in the modeling and the experimentation you've seen is really controlling the nano or mesostructure. Um, and of course, we can make films, we can make two-dimensional films, we can make tubes and so on, but um, the, the scale that I think your question also alluded to, obviously, is that we're really interested in reproducing, say, a structure, which has um, now fibrils, it has um, sort of coding around them, and, and then their larger scales, like the web structure and so on. So I think as we go into biomaterials production and thinking about um, usable materials for the biomedical field, um, we'll have to find ways of producing those structures because those are really key, not only for mechanics but also for especially biological properties and others. Um, so I can say that I think for the from the modeling point of view, um, creating different structures is something we can do. We might not be able to describe the process by which we can create the structures, but we can create different geometries quite naturally. And in fact, some of the, the citation here is a paper in uh, 2011 that um, one of the you know, one of the students on the project, Tristan Giso, worked on, where we looked at size effects of different bundlings and so on. And we can do a lot of those things in theory, but the limit is really we cannot predict the process that we needed to create those structures. And um, and that's something that we collectively like to do. We like to be able to predict um, not only a homogeneous network or network, but actually creating very complicated structures with multiple hierarchies. Um, and the modeling to do this processing is not quite there yet. More questions from the uh, other participants? Yes, Bob. Bob. Yes, Bob. Uh, uh, yes, Marcus. Um, uh, the question for <coughs> the question for you on the modeling, uh, and of course the, um, the the behavior of the models, uh, which, are, which are very nice, are going to be dependent on the properties that you assign to your beads. 
of course, grain beads that are representing the uh, three amino acids. And I was curious how you're, uh, how you're obtaining those properties. Are you mapping those to all atom models of the amino acids? So in the, and that again, the, the details on this are in the, in the paper that we'll be posting. Um, in a lot of these, uh, these studies I showed today, uh, we mapped them to individual amino acid properties that we either uh, simulated or measured you know, in the literature, which is hydrophilicity, hydrophilicity. Um, and in principle, um, that, is, uh, that is an important um, scale of parameterization, of course, it defines a lot of things that are happening after. So in other words, in silk, um, since we know that the microstructure, nanostructure is composed out of primarily two um, domains, hydrophilic and hydrophobic domains, which form certain secondary structures, which again, as you've seen from David's data, we understand quite reasonably well. Um, this type of parameterization actually works out um, very, very well, actually. So now if you go into a different material, and since we, we haven't talked about elastin today, but um, this is something else in the project we're exploring um, in early stages, it's not going to be as easy for elastin um, because the scale separation is not as clear. So here we have basically we're dealing with patterns where we can group amino acids very effectively, we can extract parameters, and we can do all the things you mentioned, we can find properties between the beads. In the case of elastin, um, there's a much, uh, the, the separation of scales is smeared out much more significantly, and um, doing a three amino acid parameterization for elastin would not be possible. Um, so I think what I'm trying to say is that this approach will not work for every single protein. It will work for silk and silk like proteins, um, but if you're moving into um, even collagen, which is another thing we're working on, the approach has to be modified. So it's dependent. This is sort of the of course, the, the limitation of any coarse graining is that um, it's highly dependent on the material. Um, there's no recipe for every single material, every single sequence out there. Um, but if you I mean, if you look collectively at the work we've done, and, and we've done this, again, you compare what we've done in, say, collagen versus silk, elastin, and, uh, and other materials, you can see how, how a rational approach can be found to do it. Um, but the computer won't do it alone. We need the insight from um, uh, the person running the simulation. And as, as to this, uh, I always say this, but it's really important. I think actually by by doing the cross training and trying which level of cross training you want to do, we learn so much about the behavior. And in fact, um, once we develop the model, we have developed very significant amount of understanding and sort of can then move on into the predictive phase, but we learn a lot from developing the model. Certainly, right. Uh, it forces you to get down at the molecular scale and think about things at that level. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, in silk, I mean, the way we, um, of course, it's experimental data, but also these uh, these structures here are uh, simulation predictions from the group, from our group, and they, um, give the actual rational foundation for why we do the course training we did it. And these are full atomistic simulations in this, in this particular piece here. Um, and again, we're doing the same thing with Aspen, and, uh, except the last is a much more complicated system, but it ultimately, um, yeah, you can really go well into the molecular scale, atomistic scale, the actual solvent scale, and, and identify the, the nanoscopic patterns um, that make up the material, and you can go from there. Um, if, if, again, the scale separation is important, so you can identify particles that you can then call A's and B's and so on. If you, if you can't identify those, then the only way to resolve it is basically doing a full-blown a full blown, um, microscopic detailed simulation at a very large scale. And um, in many situations, this might be uh, prohibitively expensive. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks. Any more questions? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I want to thank the speakers. Great seminar. Great webinar. Thanks, guys. Uh, go to the link to get more information. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. 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 Bye. Thanks. Bye. So, Mark, you'll be posting the slides on the wiki?
Yeah, I added already. So I have the Dropbox link already with all the files. Um, I'll be adding the slides today as a PDF. And um, I'll also be adding, we'll be collecting the papers as well. So you can have a quick agenda. So happy to, uh, for anyone interested in, in talking to the students, to me, anyone, or the postdocs, um, if you want to play with the codes, um, please get in, get in touch with us. Happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.